Bibles this morning, would you turn to the book of Acts, chapter 19? We're going to begin reading in verse 21. Thank you, Stephen. Appreciate that. And I was not able to attend Charlotte's worship service, but I heard it was truly that, a worship service, her memorial, and um, we remember and honor her today. We're going to be looking at Acts chapter 19, beginning in verse 21 in just a moment. You know, this past week really uh, brought to the close another academic year at our two higher institutions here in the Farmville area. And I was thinking back and sharing uh, earlier with Renee one of the, what I consider to be less than wise things that both schools have done over the past few years or many years has been what's called midnight breakfast. And midnight breakfast, uh, I'm glad to know it's no longer literally at midnight, but midnight breakfast can actually be a catastrophe. Now imagine you take uh, uh, professors and staff and administrators who aren't used to staying up late and they're serving food late at night. Then you have students who are jacked up on caffeine to try to be alert and excited about uh, getting out for the summer or finishing for good and you serve them breakfast at an unusual time and I can attest that bad things can and often do happen. I understand now they let them dance and that sort of gets rid of that energy but we didn't think of that back in the day so when we had midnight breakfast at Hampton Sydney there were food fights and literal food fights. I was a part of one in fact one time I observed the first year the second year I thought I would get in it and God always gets me on that. I cock back a biscuit like that with my arm and I look behind me and the dean of students was right behind me and that was my luck. Um, but if you've ever been a part of midnight breakfast, there's always that threat that it can happen, that there'll be a smorgasbord of breakfast food on people, on their clothes, on the walls, hopefully not on any staff or administrators, but there can actually be a literal chaos. It actually can happen. We know here in Acts chapter 19, we're going to read in just a moment about an event that really became chaotic. And you know, any mob group, any uh, thing like that usually begins with one person. A, a, a food fight usually begins with one person having the brilliant idea to do it and then one thing leads to another. In a food fight, it really starts out sort of amusing and fun, but in the riot that we're going to see today, there was anger, there was hatred, uh, much as we've seen shown on the television on college campuses today, uh, things were in disarray, and all of the hatred was directed toward Paul and his ministry. Look at Acts chapter 19, beginning in verse 21. It says, after these events... Paul resolved in the spirit to pass through Macedonia and Achaia and to go to Jerusalem. What were the events? The preaching in the synagogues and then preaching in Tyrannus' hall that we looked at last week. He desired to, to go to Jerusalem, and after I've been there, he said, it's necessary for me to see Rome as well. After sending to Macedonia two of those who assisted him, Timothy and Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. About their time, there was a major disturbance about the way, that is the Christian way, for a person named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Artemis, provided a great deal of business for the craftsmen. When he assembled them, as well as the workers engaged in this type of business, he said, men, you know that our prosperity is derived from this idol-making business. You see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this man, Paul, has persuaded and misled a considerable number of people by saying the gods made by hand are not gods. Not only do we run a risk that our business may be discredited, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be despised and her magnificence come to the verge of ruin, the very one all of Asia and the world worship. When the crowd had heard this, they were filled with rage and began to cry out, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. So the city was filled with confusion and they rushed all together into the amphitheater, dragging along Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonia 
Macedonians who were Paul's traveling companions. Although Paul wanted to go in before the people, the disciples did not let him. Even some of the provincial officials of Asia who were his friends sent word to him pleading with him not to venture into the amphitheater. Some were shouting one thing and some another because the assembly was in confusion and most of them did not know why they had come together. Some Jews in the crowd gave instructions to Alexander after they pushed him to the front, motioning with his hand. Alexander wanted to make his defense to the people, but when they recognized that he was a Jew, they all shouted in unison for about two hours, great as Artemis of the Ephesians, when the city clerk had calmed the crowd down. He said, people of Ephesus, what person is there who doesn't know that the city of Ephesians is the temple guardian of the great Artemis and of the image that fell from heaven? Therefore, since these things are undeniable, you must keep calm and not do anything rash. If you have brought these men who are not temple robbers or blasphemers of our goddess, so if Demetrius and the craftsmen who are with him have a case against anyone, the courts are in session and, and there are proconsuls. Let them bring charges against one another. But if you seek anything further, it must be decided in a legal assembly. In fact, we run a risk of being charged with rioting for what happened today since there's no justification that we can give as a reason for this disturbance. After saying this, he dismissed the assembly. Let's pray. Father, as we look at this uh, New Testament account, um, Father, we thank you that the gospel is the truth of God and is the light of God. And when truth comes to that which is false and when light comes to that which is dark, Lord, the clash, and, and Lord, we see that today as we look at our text. We thank you for the gospel of Jesus Christ that does invade the lives of individuals who are not walking with you and confronting them with the truth of the need for repentance and faith. So speak in this hour, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. You know, I titled this morning's message, A Raucous in Ephesus. Paul, as we look here in Acts chapter 19, and, and there's no reason to not think that what we see described in Ephesus happens sequentially. We would say that Paul had been in Ephesus for a little over two years at this point. Last week, we looked at the truth that he began a ministry in the synagogues. He was run out of the synagogues. He went to Tyrannus' hall. Many people think that that hall was rented out during part of the day for Paul to carry out this ministry. And he he carried the gospel to the Gentiles there. And so he faced some adversity. He's been facing adversity in this study, in these uh, three journeys that we've been uh, considering the last few months. But really, there was nothing like we see here today, where there becomes a riot. Uh, he had faced opposition in the temple. He had faced uh, d dissension even among his own ranks. But this is the first time publicly there was a literal riot. And we see that it is such that the disciples and even those who weren't believers were concerned for his life. And so today, we're going to look at Paul's focus, and, and we don't want to jump over the first two verses, because while the real action happens in the third verse and on from which we read, the first two verses are critical for us to understand Paul and what he was doing. But then we will look at the action of the riot, and, and finally, we're going to look at how uh, this clerk, this unnamed individual, uh, becomes an instrument in God's hands to quell the riot and allow Paul to continue on in ministry. You know, as we uh, are looking again, I want to revisit a truth that we've been focused on during all three of these journeys. And the truth is this, Paul was irrepressible. Paul was a focused individual. It did not matter if there was dissension within the mission team, as we saw between him and Barnabas over John Mark. It did not matter if his life was threatened. Uh, it did not matter, matter if he was cast out of uh, 
uh, the synagogues due to Jewish opposition. And even when he was in prison, we saw in Acts chapter 16, he continued to carry out the gospel ministry that God had given him. He carried out the ministry. It was not diminished in its vigor. And so we want to look at this today. Uh, and it's very important for us to see that with all of this happening around Paul continued steadfastly in the work. I wonder today, are you steadfast in the calling that God has given you? No matter what's happening around you, even if you're going through a discouraging time now, maybe you're going through a great time now, uh, but God's desire is that we be focused in the mission that he's given us, and Paul was that way. Well, before we look at this melee, and I do want to look at that, I want to see the agenda of Paul we see in the first two verses, because I believe it reveals his heart. And so we're going to look at Paul's determination uh, in these first couple of verses. It says, after these events, what were those events? What we looked at last week, the ministry in the synagogues, the ministry in Tyrannus' hall, Paul resolved in his spirit to go to Macedonia and Achaia. Now, why was he going to Macedonia and Achaia? He was seeking, we understand from 2 Corinthians chapter 8, he was seeking to raise funds to help with destitute Jews in Jerusalem. And, and so we see here first Paul's determination. Paul was determined to continue in ministry. Uh, the scripture says, for where a person's treasure is, uh, there that person's heart is. Paul didn't treasure the material things. Paul was an itinerant preacher. He didn't, he didn't concern himself with earthly things things. He was motivated by advancing the kingdom of God. He was driven. He was irrepressible. A couple of years ago in our um, midweek study on, on Wednesday nights, we studied the book of Daniel. And as we studied the book of Daniel, one of the most impressive unbelievers in history, in my opinion, just looking at um, just uh, abilities and drive was Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great was irrepressible. In the book of Daniel, he and his empire are described like a leopard with wings. Uh, Alexander the Great died very early at the age of 33, but he had an insatiable desire to conquer territories. In fact, it's been said that, that even he would give up the obligatory harems when he would overcome one territory because he said, that I can't bother myself with women. I can't bother myself. There are more territories to conquer. There's more areas is that I need to put my foot on and, and gain control over. But God showed him that he couldn't do it because he died at a young age and he didn't even have time for family. So when he died, he had no descendant that could take over and thus the kingdom was divided and, and the kingdom ended up falling. But I thought about him this week and that insatiable desire to continue to go to new territories. Paul had that same desire. And he would not be stopped. The only difference was Paul had God's honor and God's kingdom at the center of his thought, not building his own name. And so we see that Paul here, he, he is ministering in Ephesus, but he's going to go to Macedonia. He's going to go to Achaia, other parts of, of the known world, and he's going to return to Jerusalem. And then he had his sights even beyond that. In fact, there are two cities that are mentioned in verse 21 that really reveal his heart. The first is Jerusalem. Jerusalem is God's city. It is a special city even today. It is a city for God's people. We know from our studies again in 2 Corinthians chapter 7 that Paul collected an offering that he took to the, the people in Jerusalem. In fact, we see that he sent uh, Erastus there uh, in uh, verse 22 and Timothy there. And, and obviously that was to begin to collect the offerings to take. And you say, well, why was he concerned about Jerusalem? Why was he concerned about the Jews? Well, it was a great unifier. This offering coming from many Gentiles as it would come to Jews would almost be a gift of appreciation that the Jews had accepted the Gentiles. They had come to understand that, yes, Gentiles could become believers. And so among the Jews, it was sort of a looking back and saying, hey, we're one. You're, you may be of a different nationality, but we care about you you. We're one, and this offering is showing that. But also it was a testament or a testimony 
to the other Jews who had yet to believe. And so Paul, we can't miss that fact. Paul was always looking for an opportunity to advance the gospel. That's why for the church today, we should be concerned about physical needs around us. But if we just meet the physical needs, we're not seeking to meet the spiritual needs, then we're, we're falling short of what God has for us. And so Paul was concerned about Jerusalem. But I want you to see a, a second city that was very important, Rome. I've had the blessing, and Karen's had the blessing because of this church to view Rome. It's a beautiful place. Man, it was so, so many great memories there in the couple of days that we were there. But as we look at it strategically, contextually, at this time in history, Rome was the center of everything. Now, Rome to Paul represented westward expansion. You know, Alexander the Great, he was looking at moving more and more north and east. Paul was looking in a right way of moving more west, carrying the gospel of Christ. But more than just the westward expansion, Rome was critical because it was a decision-making area. In fact, we even see it today when we look at this clerk, when he, he's trying to stop the crowd and he's saying, look, we do not want a disturbance here. We don't want a riot here. Why was that? He was concerned with Rome because they were a, a vassal state under Rome. And he said, hey, we've got our good thing going here. We're ruling ourselves. If we have a riot here, then we're going to get the attention of Rome. And if we get the attention of Rome, they're going to be upset with us. So it wasn't just geographically that Paul was motivated to go to Rome. He wanted to go at the center of where decisions were made, where there was a great impact. And so we see Paul's heart to advance the gospel. And simply put, if you want to look at Paul's life as we've studied it, Paul was looking at right in front of him, what is God calling me to do right now? He was doing that in Ephesus, but he also had a view for what was beyond him. And it's a picture for us of the local church. We should be doing in our community what God has called us to do right now. We should be meeting needs as we're aware. We should be visiting. We should be inviting. We should be carrying out our ministry always with a view to advancing the gospel, not just where we are, uh, but beyond. So we see Paul's determination. But I want you to see also the people's disturbance. Paul did not stay in Ephesus because it was easy. In the first couple of verses, he, he sent uh, Timothy and Erastus uh, to Macedonia, but it says that he himself stayed in Asia, which meant he stayed in Ephesus, which was the, the center there of, of that uh, state or that province of uh, of Rome. And so he didn't stay because it was easy. In fact, we see very quickly there was chaos and there are a few things we need to understand about the people's disturbance here. We see it described in, in verse 23. Disturbances usually start with one person. And that was the case here. Demetrius, his feathers were ruffled. He was upset by the ministry of Paul. And we're going to see why in a moment. But the scripture notes that the origin very clearly began with one person. Think about this. Every disease, when it enters a particular area, comes through one person, one situation. Um, Demetrius was the entry point for this riot. When, when I was young, back in the 1970s and 1980s, we used to sing a song that was very popular. You may remember it, uh, Pass It On. And, and the song Pass It On starts like this. It only takes a spark to get a fire going. In other words, what it's saying is it begins with one person. We're ministering, and we minister to that person, and that person ministers to, to another, and then all of that begins to progress. Paul was that spark for the kingdom. He was coming into areas and he, he was ruffling feathers because people were saying, what Paul is saying is the truth. What we've been following is a lie. And so he was a spark to accomplish good for God's kingdom. Demetrius, in contrast, was a spark working against the gospel. And so disturbances usually start with one person. This is something I think you would agree if you look at the, ter uh, the, the television today. Th there's a second aspect of disturbances. 
Disturbances often involve uninformed people. Uninformed people. Look at verse 29 of our text. It says, so the city was filled with confusion. There was chaos. And they rushed all together in the amphitheater. What did they do? They convened in cities. They convened in populated places, dragging along Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians who were Paul's traveling companions. If they could have found Paul at that point, they would have dragged him and probably beaten him. Uh, they found what they thought to be the next best thing, the people who were friends with him. They were trying to send a message. But look at verse 32. Some were shouting one thing and some another because the assembly was in confusion. And let me emphasize the rest of it. And most of them did not know even why they had come together. Does that sound familiar? There are a lot of people today that are rioting on college campuses. They feel disenfranchised. They feel acts of rebellion. And they think we will just join in this. Many of them don't even know what is going on. But let's make no mistake. There's a third truth. Riots are not of God. They're not of God. Not in any way. Satan is the author of confusion. If you see people destroying things, if you see people invading things, you can be sure it's not of God. And we have seen in our day, whether it be people on the far right or on the far left, which is both and not to the exception one to the other, we have seen Satan use both groups of trying to destroy and disregard human authority. Martin Luther King Jr. had it right. When, when he led people to protest against segregation, he did it from a Christian perspective. He said, there will be no violence. We will stand strong, but we will not fight wrong with wrong. And that is the truth. Uh, whenever you see a riot, if you see it, I don't care what group, what perspective, right or left, if you see that, you can immediately know that is not God's way because God is a God of order. But there's a, a fourth important truth in regard to this riot. It is inevitable that the gospel will conflict with the world. It's inevitable. An innocuous Christianity is a Christianity that says, we're just going to acquiesce. We're going to back off. That's not true Christianity. Christianity, by its very nature, confronts the culture. What was happening in Ephesus? Ephesus had its own thing going on. People were living their own lives. And guess what? The gospel was invading their lives. They were offended, really, if they would acknowledge the truth, not by Paul, but by the power that was behind Paul, which was the power of God convicting and changing lives. And it was changing the city, and it led people to be unsettled. Jesus told us that the gospel itself can divide even family member from family member. And what does that mean, that God's a divider of families? No, but when the gospel comes and we choose to follow the Lord Jesus Christ and he's the priority, there will be uh, repercussions. There will be things that will happen. And so let's look finally today at a ruler's declaration. We see Paul, he was determined. He was ministering there in Ephesus in spite of being threatened. He had a vision to go beyond that. He was looking out for Jerusalem and the saints and how that would advance the gospel and the testimony and the encouragement. He was looking to Rome, a strategic center to the West, that if he could uh, carry the gospel there, and he would carry the gospel there, but if he could carry the gospel there, at that time, it would make a great impact. Then we saw the people's disturbance. But let's look at a ruler's declaration. Why was the crowd agitated? Well, Demetrius, he did start it all. And there's really a primary true reason and then a smokescreen. Um, let's look at what happened there. About that time, there was a major disturbance, verse 23. Verse 24, Demetrius, a silversmith, made silver shrines of Artemis, and it provided a great deal of business for the craftsmen. What was happening was this. Demetrius made money from Artemis. 
If you've ever been uh, to King's Dominion, uh, Disney World, if you've ever been to famous cities, what are you going to see? Convenience stores that are selling all types of little relics. All You can't get out of these places without have this little Eiffel Tower, have this. Uh, Demetrius was the type, he was making small types of idols of this idol so that when people would come to the city and visit the, the temple of Artemis or Diana, they said, well, we've got to have a souvenir. I'll be honest, I'm a souvenir keeper too. I've got magnets of places that I've been. And so what Demetrius is saying, if this Paul keeps on converting people to Christianity, what is going to happen is Artemis is going to go down. And if Artemis goes down, I'm going to have a whole lot of these things that I've made at my own disposal because I can't sell them. So what was the motivation for him? He was self-centered. It was greed. I'm going to lose money. Now, whether it's money or whether it's possessions or whether it's your lifestyle, what you want to do, the gospel will come and confront and say, whatever is your treasure must be after Christ. It could be uh, a spouse. It could be a, a child. It could be a parent. Anything that stands in the way. For Demetrius, it was very clear. He cared more about making money than having the gospel there. So when it came, when push came to shove, he tried to rise up, uh, uh, raise up rather, a crowd that would get Paul out of the city. But we see also the smokescreen, verse 27. Not only do we run a risk, verse 27, that our business may be discredited, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be despised and her magnificence come to the verge of ruin. The very one all of Asia and the world worship. Do you think he was concerned about Artemis? Only as Artemis made him money. But he'll throw up a smoke screen. And there are people, when the gospel comes to them, they'll throw up a smoke screen. One of them said, I must go bury a, a family member. I must go check out some property that, I'm bought, that I've bought. Excuses, excuses, smokescreen excuses why someone will not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ or will resist the gospel. Uh, the Artemis issue wasn't the primary issue. The primary issue was that his pocketbook was affected. You know, in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, Paul says the gospel is the power of God's salvation to all who believe, the Jew and the Gentile. But it is not just a powerful uh, gospel to those who believe, but it is powerful even against those who do not believe. Last week, we saw people who turned their books in, witchcraft books and things like that, that they were making money themselves from, and they burned them. But even today, God is rattling people's cages. And by that, I mean the gospel comes into a person's home. The gospel comes into a territory or into the workplace. And all of a sudden, people's worlds are rattled. The gospel is calling people to repent and to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Is the gospel offensive it certainly is. Even as light is offensive to darkness, even as the truth is offensive to a lie, even as soap is offensive to dirt. I've got a washing machine downstairs, and sometimes I think that thing's going to rattle off what I set it on because that agitator kicks in, and it takes all of that soap, and it just just takes the clothing and just agitates, agitates, jerks it around. I think the house is going to fall down sometimes almost. But what is it doing? The soap is penetrating the darkness. Is it right for right to offend wrong? It is. So things were quickly pressing in on Paul. He was just doing what God called him to do. And we see how God protected him. And this is so interesting. God used a nameless man. In fact, in verse 35, when the city clerk had calmed the crowd down. Now, this city clerk, to our knowledge, was not a believer. He was a nameless man. 
And his motivation was even wrong. Why do you think this city clerk, well, I'm sure the ride made him feel uncomfortable, but what he basically was saying is, don't wake up Caesar. If you start to get this in, in this place, it gets in disarray, and I'm going to lose my job because Caesar may come in and he'll say, hey, I, I, I let the proconsuls, I let these people here rule in this area, and they're not doing their job. And so the city clerk, while God used him, he didn't have the greatest of motivation. Still, God used a nameless man, an unbeliever, with an ungodly motivation to stop a riot, preserving Paul in the ministry. God can do anything. God is sovereign. We see him work here. We see not only in the work of the clerk, but we see also that there were some unbelieving leaders. It said the disciples were warning the unbelieving leaders in the city were saying, Paul, ho, oh, oh now, don't get in trouble here. God was prompting those people. I want you to understand the world is in chaos even as I speak. We see it on college campuses. We see it around the world. And it is not because of a particular group or even person. While that's usually the avenue through which it is manifested, it is Satan at work. And only one can overthrow Satan, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. The world is in chaos today because it has rebelled against God. It has tried to cast off His rule, His truth, His word, His precepts, and the raucous is not confined just to Ephesus, but we see it even today. But I appeal to you today, God is still in control. He is in control. Psalm 2, Karen and I read a couple of days ago, the nations are in a rage. The leaders are wanting to cast off the rule of God. And it says that the Lord laughs. I think someone said, God has never had to hold an emergency meeting. And he hasn't. God can do what only God can do. And sometimes he can even use ungodly people to accomplish his will. He works his sovereign plan, and God was above the fray. I don't know what's going on in, in your life today. It may be that the riot may be within your spirit, within your soul. It may be that there's a conflict within your family and the workplace. It may just be in a time when you need to cry out to God. It may be today that God is calling you to follow Him and you realize that that following Him may be unsettling to other people. But I want you to know this. Choose God. God was above the fray there. And He's above the fray today. So I have two questions for you today. Do you know Him? Do you know the one that Paul spent so much time and effort to share a message about? Do you know Jesus Christ? I don't mean can you recite facts about him, but is he in your life? Do you know him personally? Do you know him relationally? You can. The Bible says there's one thing that stands between us and God, and that's our sin. And we have all committed sins every day. We'd be shocked at how many sins because uh, the psalmist mentions, I think, in, in Psalm 19 that, that there are even sins that we're not aware of. But the ultimate sin is the sin of rejection of Jesus Christ and not relinquishing our life. What did Demetrius, what was his motivation? I choose, he said, to follow the money rather than the Lord. What are you following today? Who are you following today? When you say to the Lord, God, I repent, just as we saw last week. I, I want to get rid of those things that are not of you. I repent. I believe Jesus died for me, and I make Jesus Lord of my life. No matter what the ruckus may be as a result, I choose you. The first question is, do you know him? The second is for this. If you're a Christian, do you make him known? Do you rattle some cages? Now, I'm not talking about taking your Bible to work and beating someone on the head. That's, that's human effort. But are you living such a life before people that it leads to an unsettling? They say, you know, that, 
that lady, that man has something I don't have. And, and I'm, I'm a little bit uncomfortable here. There's a time when we as Christians need to make people feel uncomfortable as the light makes the darkness uncomfortable. So as a Christian today, what are you doing to make him known? There's a great opportunity, tangible opportunity. We have two weeks from today, an outdoor service, out in the open air, pray for good weather. Uh, many people will come if you'll just invite them. Hey, join me. Hey, we're going to have food. Uh, we've got plenty of food. Invite people out. Be like Paul. Have a mission. Have a vision. God, this is what I, I, I feel that you're leading me to do in my workplace. This is beyond what, is, what, what I'm seeing now that you're leading me to in the future. Be, be open to how God leads. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the example of Paul who was undeterred with all the chaos around him. Lord, he was willing to go right into the crowd. And I believe if he had gone in the middle of that crowd, he would have preached the gospel just as he did throughout every city that we have studied to this point. But Father, you protected him and preserved him. God, you're sovereign over all. You even used a nameless clerk who didn't believe in you to uh, pragmatically lead the people to, to stop the riot. But Father, as we see, the truth is this, the gospel conflicts with the world. The gospel conflicts with a heart that does not trust in you. But Father, we thank you for that agitation because Lord, someone can choose you and experience peace with God. Lord, help us to be instruments as Paul to carry the gospel. And we realize when we carry that gospel, it may by its very nature be offensive to someone filled with pride who will not accept you. But Lord, help us to be faithful. And we pray it in Jesus' name.